Well, good afternoon and welcome to the Bulkley Valley Research Center virtual seminar series. Very pleased to have you join us this afternoon. My name is Dawn Hansen. I'm the executive director of the Bulkley Valley Research Center, and I'm hosting the seminar today on the traditional territory of the Ginnungden clan of the Wet'suwet'en Nation on the banks of the Bulkley River. I'd like to thank our funders that help make these seminar series possible. It's the RBC Tech for Nature funding, uh, Bulkley Valley Community Foundation, and the Wudzinkwa Community Forest, and as well as um, our numerous members who purchase a membership, whether it's an individual or an organization or a larger support membership. And that just allows uh, events such as our socials and our seminar series to happen. Uh, we don't receive core funding for activities like this. And so it's a great boost to the center when we do receive membership support. Thanks to all of you new for joining us. We are thrilled today to be hearing from Donna and Brianna Broches, uh, looking at field treatments in Burns Lake Community Forest. Donna graduated from the Maritime Forest Ranger School in New Brunswick and made her way to BC in 1992. She's worked in a variety of areas, silviculture surveying, BC timber services, silviculture tech, uh, woodlot programs, and uh, is working now as a senior authorization specialist in, uh, oh no, that was previous, senior authorization specialist in the Dina region. And she's working now as a silviculture specialist with the Burns Lake Community Forest. And she has all kinds of critters on a hobby farm. It sounds like that would be a great visit out there. <laughs> uh, Brianna has a background in silviculture and wildfire uh, with years of experience running planting programs and more recently fuel mitigation projects. She's a certified wildland fire ecologist, forester in training and starting a PhD program with the University of Alberta. And her study will focus on the operational feasibility of fuel hazard abatement work initiated by industry and will aim to improve the classification of anthropogenic fuel types. Welcome so much to both of you and thanks for joining us this afternoon. Thanks Thank for you for having us. us. Um, yeah, I had a presenter slide up, but you kind of covered all of it. So yeah, my name is Brianna Broche, FIT, uh, Certified Wildland Ecologist. Um, I'm presenting today from GeoTerra in Prince George, which is where I'm currently working, and we're situated on the traditional territory of the Klitli today. And yeah, I'm excited to be presenting some of this case studies and uh, as well to be presenting with my mom. So thanks for having us. And Donna Broche. Um, I want to acknowledge that the Burns Lake Community Forest is grateful to be working with the following First Nations across our COM4, and they would be uh, Stilkas Co. Lake Babi Nation, Wet'suwet'en First Nation, Skintai, Nitai Bun First Nation, and Stalatin. Um, yeah, thank you all for joining us, and uh, we're hoping that you're going to enjoy this. All right, so a little context for people that aren't familiar with the Burns Lake Community Forest. It's uh, an area based tenure that surrounds the village of Burns Lake and spans 92,000 hectares, and it is one of the oldest community forests in the, pro uh, in the province. It's located on the traditional territory of the Wet'suwet'en people and consists of subreal spruce and Engelman spruce subalpine fir beck zones. The first case study, which I'll be presenting, looks at uh, a couple of the eastern sides here, and that's the mechanical raking fuel treatments. And the second case study, which Donna will be presenting, is the prescribed fire that happened on this western side. So this project was initiated in 2016 and aspects of it continue into 2023. But when I worked with the community forest in 2021 and 2022, I had the opportunity to write the results of this treatment in a peer reviewed paper with Dr. Sonia Lavercus as my co-author. We've since published in the Journal of Ecosystems and Management and I hope to continue this type of work as I enter into my PhD with Alberta. Um, so before I begin, I'd really like to thank the community forest for supporting that work and for allowing me to present it again here today. I know you guys are watching down in that basement, so if there's any questions that I can't answer, I'll be directing them your way at the end of this. So keep an eye on the chat. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, as I said, this project initiated 2016 following the Fort McMurray wildfire in Alberta. There were similar forest types and fuel types in the Burns Lake area and extensive areas of red and gray attacked pine stands within the community forest. These areas were experiencing blowdown and becoming more and more hazardous to the public, which presented a wildfire risk that was only getting worse, uh, worse each and every year. 
Fuel treatments were needed, and so priority units were selected, referencing the 2012 Guide to Fuel Hazard Assessment and Abatement in BC, which is a BC Welfare Service guidance document. These units were located in two areas that consisted of multiple blocks where fuel treatments were proposed. The first was in and around the Boar Mountain, which is host to a campground around Kager Lake and some world-class mountain bike trails. The risk of wildfire was high, not only due to the fuels, but also from anthropogenic ignition. Summers at Boar Mountain have the campground full and there are multiple fire pit locations uh, throughout the woods at tenting spots, which just increased the likelihood of accidental fire. The Burns Lake Comfort also wanted to clear up the area to avoid injury to users from dead standing timber, falling over in wind events, um, which as you saw in the previous pictures was happening more readily each and every day. So 22 blocks adding up to approximately 160 hectares were laid out for partial harvest and subsequent field treatment. The second unit comprised of 10 blocks, which was approximately 100 hectares, and was located further from town. This area was selected based on its proximity to values, including a major hydro line and a few mills, and was also uh, in this area because it was an access point that was only through a single road that took you know, almost an hour to drive to the back of. If a wildfire were to ignite in this portion of the community forest, the response time would be limited to aerial suppression until crews could get back there, by which time the mill sites would likely be panicking and Highway 16 at risk. This unit was clear cut harvested to create more of a fuel break, which uh, with less focus on the aesthetic quality that the partial harvest blocks had in the Boar Mountain area. The background of this map shows the risk classification for areas of low to severe fuel hazards, which is a data layer that can be found on the BC Wildfire Service website and is referenced in the 2012 guide. The degree of hazard abatement will differ depending on the fuel hazard and severe areas, which is red on this map, um, we'll have more intensive work requirements to get fuel hazards down. So again, referencing that 2012 guide, a fuel load of five tons per hectare was determined as being necessary in these severe areas. So once we had that target fuel load, the units were then hazard abated. Burns Lake Comfort elected to use mechanical treatments as opposed to prescribed fire due to the haste in wanting these areas cleaned. Mechanical treatments oftentimes don't have the same limitations that prescribed fire can, and can be conducted without as much consideration to weather constraints uh, and are generally lower risk to perform. This was especially important in the Boar Mountain units as the public frequents that area and it becomes a tourist destination once the snow melts. So being able to treat the units before the summer season hit was a bonus. Unlike your standard mechanical treatments, which tend to be thinning and pruning, the Burns Lake Comfort used excavators with modified brush rate attachments, which you can see in this photo, to collect fine fuels and attempt reaching that five ton per hectare limit via raking. The use of mechanical raking is new, and when myself and Dr. Leverkus were writing the paper on this case study, we could not find any other published reports that referenced it being used for field treatments. So from a published perspective, this is the first time this treatment has been used for fuel reduction. So this is just a picture of one of the blocks in the FES unit, our clear cut harvest areas, uh, right after harvesting. And you can see the amount of fuel that's been left on the ground. Unfortunately, since there isn't a single required methodology for measuring fuel loads in BC, the pre-treatment assessments were done visually and can't accurately be compared to our post-treatment measures. I don't recommend using visual assessments for fuel load as they can be misleading and are highly user dependent. But if I were to hazard a guess, I'd say the total fuel load in this example is probably in the 70 to 80 range uh, with fine fuels contributing 25 to 30 tons per hectare. So these are a couple pictures of the same FES unit following mechanical raking. So this area had been clear cut harvested and then mechanically raked. So there is significant uh, amount of mineral soil exposed and uh, site degradation. You can also see a fair number of debris piles that were made during the raking that extend throughout each block across the entire unit. But from a fuel point of view, there doesn't look to be much left. This time, though, we were able to measure the fuels using the recommended methodology in the 2012 guide and don't have to rely on visual assessments. So the method of fuel measurement we used is based on the methods developed by McRae et al. and Trowbridge et al. and are recommended by BC Welfare Service in that 2012 guide. This method uses a go-no-go -go gauge that measures fine fuels up to seven centimeters in diameter, which roughly correlate to the different dead fuel moisture classes. Pieces of uh, woody debris that were larger than seven centimeters were called large or coarse fuels, 
and are generally not thought to contribute much to initial fire spread, so they weren't the concern for the fuel treatment itself. The focus was on reducing those fine fuels to that five ton per hectare threshold, such that wildfire intensity would remain at a level actionable by ground crews. We uh, established a minimum of two plots per strata following this diagram here, and then calculated fuel load for each transect line and averaged those across each plot, which were then averaged across uh, the entire unit. We did these calculations using the tools provided through the BC Welfare Service website under tools for fuel management. So across the unit, there were uh, 32 mechanically raked blocks, 22 were partially harvested and 10 were in those clear cut FES areas. Now here's where the visual assessment comes to bite you. When looking at the fine fuel load that met that one to five ton per hectare threshold, only five blocks in each unit met the necessary level of hazard abatement that those severe areas require. That's only one third of the blocks passing. This result would initially suggest that the Burns Lake Comfort did not adequately hazard abate to the recommendations in the 2012 guide, which had us wondering why that level had not been met, and then if that level was a good indicator of a properly hazard abated site. Now, our first thought was that the mechanical raking had failed. Clearly, we didn't meet that 5 ton per hectare threshold as the average across all these blocks was 7 tons per hectare, not 5. This is close, but would require the community forest to provide justification as to why those thresholds were not met, which can be time consuming and honestly a bit redundant if you look at the post-treatment pictures. With that amount of mineral soil exposed, surely the welfare hazard is reduced sufficiently which is why I don't recommend the visual assessments. Using the method in that 2012 guide, we found that enough small debris had been left across the majority of the blocks that it tallied up to five tons per hectare, despite being discontinuous and having no real fuel bed depth. So maybe this was an issue with the threshold being too restrictive. But then we looked at the post-post treatment site conditions. The process of mechanical raking required operators to make numerous debris piles throughout the blocks as they worked. Uh, the blocks, were, had so much debris on them following the harvesting that piles had to be located throughout and could not be pulled to the road. As a result, we ended up with an extensive amount of debris piles that needed burning. And because of continuous weather and venting constraints, the process of burning these piles prior to post-treatment fuel measures cannot be completed within a reasonable timeline. So we ended up in a situation where some debris piles had been burned and others had not, and others still were somewhere in between. As such, when we came upon piles that had not been burned or were partially burned during the field tallies, we stepped off of them by a meter and then tallied up the length of the pile before returning to the original transect line. This was done under the assumption that the piles would be mitigated at some point and would not remain as unnatural accumulations of fuel. However, doing this could have underestimated the fuel load we tallied, meaning the final averages may actually be higher than what we, uh, what we ended up with. Now, this is no, there was no way the Burns Lake Comp 4 could have predicted this outcome, as there is little to no references available for mechanical raking as a field treatment. That was just another reason that uh, myself and Sonia wished to publish this case study, so as to bring attention to some of the possible results and have a baseline for future projects to build from. So now we know what to expect and can try and make changes uh, from that point on. In addition to the piles, site degradation and mineral soil exposure are concerns of mechanical raking performed in these fuel types. As a community forest with numerous overlapping considerations, the fuel treatments tended to take priority and could not really account for other values, such as coarse woody debris or wildlife. For fuel reduction, mechanical raking was effective at getting fine fuel loads below 10 tons per hectare, but may not be as practical where five tons per hectare is required. That being said, uh, mechanical raking is still a very viable fuel treatment. It just might be better suited for different post-harvest conditions. Though I lack the pictures in this presentation, the Boar Mountain units had much more vegetation come back in the post-treatment blocks, which could better account for the varying values that the community forest has to balance. Uh, the cost of mechanical raking is relatively low compared to other fuel treatments, ranging anywhere from $1,600 to $1,700 per hectare. Uh, and can be performed by a single operator without need for a crew or other resources on standby. Mechanical raking may also be better suited uh, when you have timely field treatments in and around more sensitive areas, allowing wildfire mitigation to occur regardless of weather constraints that tend to hinder prescribed fire. But when the weather does cooperate, um, well, I'll let Donna fill you in on that. Okay, uh, case study number two, our prescribed burn. Um, 
was September 13th, 2022. That's when the fun began. Uh, this block is just outside of the Wui, uh, and the total burn was approximately 31 hectares. Uh, the block has some visual constraints, and even though we received an exemption in this visual area, uh, it was felt by Shifting Mosaics and Burnside Community Forests that we wanted to make an effort to uh, protect uh, the visual polygon as much as we could. This proved to be a task for sure, uh, and it took up a sizable amount of our resources. We estimated uh, we used about uh, 50,000 gallons of water just in the uh, top area of the uh, WTRA um, in both the defending and the mop up phase. Um, before you consider prescribed burning, this needs to be considered, at least we feel, uh, at your harvest stage. It, it's something that when you're thinking about uh, your harvesting, also have in the back of your mind uh, doing a burn, if that's what you want to do. Uh, this allows for many efficiencies, such as setting up your cat guard work, and you also get to deal with other areas uh, requiring uh, fuel-free boundaries. Uh, use of existing roads should be considered in the prescription from which to hold a fire line. Uh, developing a checklist that can be tweaked for each of your units is also um, something that you should consider. Uh, you should be considering your water sources, your road access, existing land constraints like AUGMAS, LCMs, GAR orders. Um, these uh, um, land constraints can really break your plan fast. It can break the bank as well. So planning at the harvest stage, uh, I feel you really need to consider that. Um, uh, the slide that you're looking at currently uh, shows the uh, green highlighted or the area, the wildlife tree retention area in the VQO. That's the area that we got the exemption for. Um, the in internal WTRAs, we also manage those as well. Um, Going on to your next slide, our next slide. Uh, so this um, slide shows an area for the uh, FHT, meaning the fuel, uh, the fine fuel had to be within six to 19 tons per hectare. Treatment was needed, uh, was needed to meet this FHT. Uh, the area is approximately 55 kilometers from the uh, town site of Ferns Lake, northwest of Ferns Lake. Uh, the main fuel type here is a S1, which is a jack pine, lodgepole pine slash, which tends to be uh, erratic uh, when it's burning and it can be, it's, it's very unpredictable. Uh, this uh, fuel measurement pretreatment slide, uh, the average fuel load here was 70 tons per hectare. Fine fuel load was 23.22 tons per hectare. And the coarse fuel load was 46.78 tons per hectare. These measures were taken over uh, 2020 and 2021. Bearing in mind that we wanted to burn this block in 2020, but due to uh, resource constraints, uh, weather, uh, there's a whole lot of things that sort of creeped it in on us and uh, we ended up uh, doing the burn in 2022. Uh, prepping for the, pre oh, before I go any further, this link is an awesome link. Uh, that uh, Shifting Mosaics did. I encourage you to have a look at it. It kind of shows the burn from the beginning to the end, uh, a lot of video detail. So it's uh, it's a fantastic uh, video to have a look at. Um, prepping for the prescribed burn took place over a period of three years. Prescriptions were written by Dr. Lavercus of Shifting Mosaics and input from Burnside Community Forest as well as uh, BC Wildfire Service uh, are all part of uh, this prescription. Uh, the planning of this um, project was intense. At one point, there was a change in the team with BC Wildfire Service. So there was a bit of a delay there, about 10 months. In addition to this, the weather uh, was really not cooperating. Traditionally, you want to be burning in the spring, but because this is a high elevation ESSF uh, block, uh, the snowpack just wouldn't give us a break. Um, and so we uh, elected to burn in the fall, which can which has its own um, issues as well. Uh, a, a window became available in September of 2022, September 13th. 
uh, right before sub September 13th, that weekend, uh, Shifting Mosaics was contacted and within three days they were en route with their team members, uh, their trailers, um, setting up the, uh, the wet lines, uh, the four pumpkins. They had approximately six people on their team. Burnside Community Forest added four more people to make up the required team of 10. And then we had additional support if required by our uh, logging companies. Uh, we also had three tenders on, on site and they helped, up, helped us out as well, which was really, really great. Uh, we couldn't get air support locally uh, because we still had fires burning in the province. And so we ended up uh, having to uh, hire a, a very, very experienced uh, helicopter from Fort Nelson. Um, the next, uh, this, this is an amazing, this is probably one of my favorite um, slides. It shows you just how wonderful this burn went off. The venting is impeccable. Uh, and, and it's just, it's doing everything it's supposed to do. Uh, the burn prep on the day of the burn consisted of uh, a detailed safety meeting that um, Dr. Lavercus uh, had. We had an incident command system roster that you would see that's similar to BC wildfire. Um, and so uh, Sonia was the incident commander and I was uh, crew lead for my team, which would be the people from Burnside Community Forest as well as all my, my operators. Uh, BC Wildfire unfortunately couldn't be here uh, because they had, they were, uh, their initial attack and their unit crew were all all over the province. Um, and so um, we uh, were on the ground for this uh, without BC Wildfire. Um, the next uh, slide will show uh, all contractors had considerable experience with wildfires in the Lakes District and the water tender operators uh, had a, com a combined experience of 55 years of wildfire assistance. Um, on this fire, uh, we elected to use dragon eggs, and I'll explain that later on, what they, what, they, what they consist of. But basically, they're little one inch balls that you rocket out of a, a helicopter and they uh, have, uh, they ignite, uh, there's a time delay, uh, we used about 3,974 of these little dragon eggs, and uh, they ensure that you have a hot, fast running fire with high intensity so that you get the maximum use of all your resources. Uh, drip torching by hand in this case would have been, um, would not, in my opinion, wouldn't have, be a, have had such a great effect. And we would have had a lot of, uh, we would have had a, have a much bigger team. Um, after, so we had a test area and the test area was in the northeast part of the block. And that uh, test area, the reason you do a test area is to make sure that you've got your venting, make sure that your team is ready to go. It's, it's almost like a rehearsal before you set, set her all up. And so uh, once we did the test burn, BC Wildfire, we did have um, communications with Brad Martin uh, locally here and uh, we got the green light. Um, Ooh. The next slide um, shows uh, like this is probably a good hour and a half into the burn. Uh, the temperature for the burn that day was between 26 and 28 degrees Celsius. Relative humidity was about 27 and the wind speed was between 10 and 15 kilometers an hour. This block will get gusty winds. They just come and they'll totally turn direction on you. And so that was our biggest worry with this fire. Uh, the venting was awesome. The conditions were textbook. Um, so we used 120 lengths of hose, four relay tanks, five pumps. And we had a larger pump that we used at one of our water sources uh, for, for our, our tender operators that didn't have an unloading system that was fast. We needed to have a really fast turnaround. We needed to have a 20 minute turnaround on our trucks. Uh, note all water sources um, that we were originally going to use because we had such a dry season uh, were non-existent. We were fortunate that Gaiushtin Lake is about a six minute drive both ways. However, the return for my big water tenders ended up being about 20 minutes. Uh, so our guys were, were, were constantly going for water to and from. There was no, uh, there was no rest. They were constantly filling up the pumpkins. Uh, this picture uh, basically shows you, because we had to wait about three years for this fire, 
we had a lot of um, alder ingress, a lot of grass uh, that was on this block. And, and that makes your, uh, your, your mop up uh, a little bit more um, intense, particularly in the alder areas. In some of these areas, we found the fire going down, you know, six to eight inches, you'd find coals. And uh, so we, that took up a lot of time for sure. So in the future, if you're gonna be doing a prescribed burn, if you're in an area that has a lot of heavy alder, stay out of it or pre-burn it. Uh, drip torch it before you set the whole block on fire. It'll save you a lot of, uh, a lot of anxiety, let's put it that way. Uh, the three water tenders we had, we had two at 3,500 gallons and we had one at 5,000 gallons. Um, later that night around 10 p.m., uh, we had a pretty good fire going and just my gut instinct, uh, because I've been on a lot of fires provincially I, when I work with um, government, I was on teams and uh, 2017, I was on a couple of big fires. Uh, so my gut kind of had me wanting to put a cat on standby uh, on a low bed. And so I called up one of our contractors. All of our contractors were ready for standby as it was. Uh, and so if your gut is telling you to do something, you know, it might cost you some money. But at the end of the day, it, it might save you as well. Um, this next uh, photo, the fuel measurement post treatment, our average fuel load uh, in the post um, spots was 18.53 tons per hectare. The fine fuel load was, get ready for this, 2.59 tons per hectare. And the coarse fuel load was 15.93 tons per hectare. Uh, the average fuel reduction from prescribed fire was 51.47 tons per hectare. Fine fuels were reduced by 20.62 tons per hectare, and the coarse fuels were reduced by 30.84 tons per hectare. The average burn depth on this block uh, was 1.2 centimeters. Um, so these are some considerations to look at. I, I'm not gonna read off the slide, but the biggest thing that you need to do is make sure that you're communicating. You gotta communicate, you know, a year in advance, you're talking about, you know, your First Nations, the public, your stakeholders, and you got to keep doing that. And over the three years, we had to keep, uh, we had to keep communicating that this was possibility that this was going to be done. We were always preparing our our, our community uh, for the chance of of getting this fire off the ground, and we knew that it was going to be a really quick turnaround. Um, prior to burning a unit like this. Uh, we had a, you know, our access had to be improved. Uh, we, our guards uh, were three years old. And so there was a bit of a, there was problems there because they had grown in a bit. So uh, we also had to get water uh, brought in. We had at one point two helicopters. We ended up having to get uh, um, a helicopter group from Smithers to come in kind of as backup more than anything uh, because we were having a lot of uh, um, hot spots uh, with our um with our mop up, particularly in the visual area, at the top of the block. Um, your consultation includes guide outfitters, trappers, community user groups. Uh, we also had open houses uh, uh, the, the, day, the day of the fire um, and through the week. And that open house was uh, run by our board of directors and also Shifting Mosaics had put up uh, presentation maps, photos, and they were there to ask answer questions. Um, uh, make sure you've got a qualified uh, prescriber and specialist. I can't say enough about this. You need to get 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 a team that knows what they're doing. In in particular, in 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 this uh, S one uh, fuel type that we uh, we're dealing with, um, prescription has to consider unique variability that exists in each stand, including but not limited to vertical fuel st uh, strata horizontal fuel cont continuity, uh, extent of the surrounding fuel, fire weather components, topography, values at risk. And uh, these things will be stratified out if required. Uh, treatments are appropriate uh, for each given uh, biogeoclimatic zone and site series. And they consider the facts such as rate of decay for slash, shaded fuel breaks, controlling canopy density, and retaining sustainable residual species that are resilient to the post-treatment conditions including but not limited to fire disturbance. Uh, this last slide, um, okay, Brianna, I'll get you to take over. 
Yeah, this is just our discussion section now. So our discussion topic was, which is better? Is there a better option? You know, considering fuel reduction, environmental factors, cost planning, all of these things need to be considered. And there are pros and cons to using mechanical raking or prescribed fire. Uh, mechanical raking was more cost efficient and required less planning. It had more flexibility of where and when it could be used, and it can be planted right away. However, the extent of the site degradation and the longevity of the treatments are unknown at this point, uh, requiring prolonged monitoring. Debris piles were extensive and require separate treatment to remove, which adds to the cost and potential uh, potentially impacts soil condition even more. Uh, fuel reduction was also better catered to that 10 ton per hectare range rather than that intense uh, fuel hazard threshold in the severe categories, which requires five tons per hectare. Uh, in the case of the prescribed fire, um, we had better uh, fuel reduction and lower site deg, uh, making it ideal for reaching the five ton per hectare uh, FHT. Um, it is also a more natural treatment that accounts um, for other environmental factors if it's done correctly if it's done correctly, I'll say that twice. However, the planning process is much longer and depends on a more qualified professional input. Your team needs to be spot on. Um, you also have to have resources. Uh, and when I'm talking resources, I'm talking about using your, uh, your community of contractors, and then you've got your monetary uh, resources as well. Um, in, this, in both these cases, uh, Forest, and, Forest Enhancement DC, um, helped with funding with both of these treatments. Uh, having said that, our, our board of directors was, was on the same page as us from day one, and they allowed uh, us to um, put aside funds for, particularly for the uh, prescribed burn, and that, that meant a lot to have that support. Um, the burn was an amazing success. The full block was not burned. We stayed away from the, uh, the Western flank of the block, uh, we had um, um, mature timber there, so we used the we used the roads within the block uh, for our uh, setting up our wet line and for defending. And our our pumpkins were also placed on these roads so that the uh, water tenders had quick, efficient. Oh, and I need to also add turnaround. These big these big trucks need to be able to turn around an area super fast. Backing out is just not something that you want them doing. Um, the takeaway uh, water sources should be within 10 minutes of the block. Uh, employ water tenders, uh, the bigger the better. Employ contractors with experience. Use daily time slips. I didn't do this, I've done it with wildfire, but using daily time slips to record your uh, resources will really help you out in the long run. Um, I would suggest staying away from blocks that have, uh, you know, landscape um, components to them, like visuals, augments, th those sorts of things. It's just an added complexity uh, for dealing with how you're going to write your prescription. Dr. Lavercus could totally speak to that for sure. Um, and st stay away from really rich sites like the alder sites because there's a lot of mop up in those areas. Um, have resources on standby. It's going to cost you a little bit of money, but uh, it's better to be ready to, you know, deploy any resource at any given time. Um, low bed. Make sure you have a low bed on standby. A lot of people don't think about that, but low bed's really important. Remember that, uh, you know, in this case, it's an ESSF block with a re regen delay of four years. Gives us a really tight time frame, and so um, with this block. Um, I'm going to probably, I will be asking the local office for an exemption for the, for the regen delay. Uh, we could plant it this year and meet it, but I'm not, I don't want to plant it because of the uh, black army cutworm. Uh, I'm going to plant it probably next year. I also want to see when we, when Brianna and I did the uh, plots uh, after the prescribed burn, man, there was a lot of balsam seed. It was just the coolest thing I've ever seen. And so, yeah, there's, you know, fire, people see it as being destructive. But then these seeds came in because the the heat from the fire, you know, released a lot of the balsam. So that was really cool to see. Um, so uh, the answer really depends on, you know, your treatments that are going to be done, where you're going to deploy them. And the, the, the more um, research and the, the real, not even doesn't even have to be research. 
the more people that kind of get out there and talk about their their experiences, uh, there's a lot to be learned. Um, yeah, we did a lot of broadcast burning back in the 80s, um, but a lot of that expertise is retired. Um, and so we, we need to we need to kick that um, flame, fan it, whatever you want to call it. Um, Brianna, do you have anything to add, add there? No, I'll just summarize by saying, you know, it depends. Um, sometimes the decision on where on which treatment is better really just boils down to the physical characteristics of the unit. In our case studies, all the units had been harvested first and then treated, meaning we had to work around post-harvest site conditions. Um, and as Donna mentioned, like sometimes that uh, really limits what you can do or it adds costs. So with the mechanical raking blocks, we had to deal with deactivations and improving access, but we could work around those internal WTPs and reserves more effectively. Um, this was especially useful in those partial harvesting blocks. Whereas in the prescribed fire unit, we had to protect visual polygons and deal with those regen delays, uh, but we could remove almost all of the debris on the site in one go rather than needing multiple entries, um, which was required in those mechanical raking blocks. So choosing which field treatment to use can be a decision made at the pre-harvesting block planning level. Um, and that way these limitations can be better mitigated, uh, which can help bring down the cost and improve the efficiency of the project. Uh, as an example, if an area is a good candidate for a prescribed fire, access into the unit should be prolonged, uh, should have prolonged maintenance, which might illuminate winter harvesting uh, for winter roads. Uh, it can also better design WTPs so that they're not internal. Um, during harvesting, a skid trail can be established around reserves to create a fire guard. Debris can be scattered across the block instead of piled, meaning processing at the stump might be prioritized. Uh, in the mechanical raking units, such as those closer to the WUI or in recreation sites, partial harvesting can be used and piles can be more strategically placed in openings or else chipped and removed from the site altogether to avoid pile burning. Access can be maintained from machinery, meaning uh, winter harvesting might be an option because those uh, excavators can work on winter roads. So those are just a couple of considerations that we noticed in these case study, but the real limiting factor will always be available funding and a willingness for uh, more planning because both of these case studies do require a significant amount of that. Anything you'd like to add? No, not at this, not, not at this point, no. <laughs> Perfect, well, that's, uh, that's the end of our case study presentation. Thank you everyone for listening. Um, and yeah, we'd like to open it up for discussion, questions, uh, whatever the case may be. And if we can't answer your uh, question um, with full confidence, we'll get back to you. Great. Thanks very much, Donna and Brianna.